today's video, we're going to go through an in-depth first home buyer question answer session. We're going to cover questions like, what government incentives am I eligible for in 2022? How you can avoid overpaying on a property this year, if you can withdraw your super to go towards your deposit, and what's likely to happen on interest rates this year. Are they going to go up? Are they going to go down? Let's jump in. Awesome, Jaden. So I guess the first question we get asked a lot by first homeowners and people looking to buy this year is, is what happens if I change my job and is it going to affect my eligibility in getting a loan? So Jaden, walk us through this one. What does it actually look like and how does it impact people and particularly first homeowners who are trying to get in the market? Well, it's something that's coming up all the time. There's apparently the great resignation is going to be on us this year. Everyone's looking at changing jobs. Um, so it's a fair question. What happens if you've been in a job and changed? Pretty much from the bank's perspective, it's okay provided it's a permanent full or part-time job. So in other words, if you're changing jobs, you're getting a new job that you get annual leave, sick leave, even if you're on a probationary period, the bank's completely fine with one payslip. Now, it's a different case if you're a casual worker, say, for example, you're in hospitality or even in some IT jobs where you don't get paid on your leave. That's usually the best way to tell if you're casual. Now, the banks have tightened some of the rules here. They'll want you to be in that role for at least six months to accept your income. There can be some exceptions around being in the same industry for over two years if you've got less than a gap for those days. But like I said, if you're changing to a full or part-time permanent role, one payslip's all you need. So... So start sending your resume. Guys, it's important to remember if you are starting your own business, the banks for self-employed applicants are wanting at least two years history with your ABM and one full year's tax return. So just something to keep in mind if you are thinking of starting your own business, because that does make it even more of a challenge. So as Jaden said, if you are changing roles, it's not going to affect your eligibility so long as you're going to a full-time or a permanent role. If you're casual, we need more time. Like Jaden said, six months. And if you're planning to start your own business, it's going to be even longer. So Jaden, the next question we get asked a lot by first homeowners is, how do I work out my borrowing ability? Yeah, it can get so confusing. You can go on a bank's website, you punch in your income, and they'll tell you, wow, Jaden, you can borrow a million dollars, but they're not factoring in your deposit. So it's important to remember when you're trying to work out how much you can buy a home for, the two major factors that banks need you to have is one, an income, and two, a deposit. If you've got a high income, but no deposit, the bank's not going to lend you any money. And equally, if you've got a massive, you know, $2 million in the bank, but if you're not working, there's no ability to make repayments on your loan, the banks aren't going to lend you any money. So you can go to our website, huntsgalloway.com.au and click on calculate my borrowing capacity. You can put your income in here. So say I'm on 80,000, I got $40,000 in deposit, I'm a first home buyer, buying in Sydney, single, um, no dependents. And it says, yeah, while the bank will lend you $630,000 based on your income, with your deposit, you can only get a house of around 500000 So it's a combination of both to work out how much you can afford. If you want more detailed figures than that, then by all means, get in touch with a mortgage broker. Feel free to hit us up um, and we can calculate your actual borrowing capacity, what's going to be possible if you get paid overtime, different things run through that and see what you can afford this year to buy a home for. So Jade, the next question we get asked a lot is how to avoid overpaying for a property. So do you have any tips for first homeowners out there that are trying to get in the market that are concerned about overpaying? So at this point, you want to have your budget. You want to know, can you afford a home up to 500, 600,000 and know what you can get to? The next is you want to start looking at properties and suburbs and become a suburb expert. So for that, as we've said before in other videos, you really want to get to know a maximum of three suburbs in your local area that you look want to target. And the best way to get to know these suburbs, even before you start going to open homes, is a couple of tools online. So let me show you. Now, the first tool is a realestate.com.au neighborhoods tool. So you can put, um, say, the suburb that you really want to buy in. And this gives you a really high level overview of what you can afford. So for houses, you're looking at a median house price of sort of around an average for a four bedroom of 922,000. For units, there's no data, there's not many houses in Oran Park in South Wales. And it has a bunch of other interesting stats on the, on the property, as well as a couple of recent listings. But that's not really giving you sales. So I like to go one step further and look at the real estate that come to you sold section. So you can just go to real estate, click sold, um, put in the, the suburb you're looking at. Again, we'll look at Oran Park. And I might say, well, I thought my budget was 600,000. Can I buy a house there? Is it going to be possible? And looking at some of the recent sales. So again, in a hot market, you want to be looking at sales for the last month or two maximum to get a feel for the market. There's not a lot in my budget. 
Um, they're all sort of over a million dollars and more. There's a townhouse there. So maybe I need to look at townhouses or, um, you know, a house like that to be able to get something a bit more in my budget um, or possibly look at the next suburb along. And so in this case, if you found that Oran Park might be out of your budget, then you can go back to the real estate company neighborhood tool and check out, well, I want to buy a house, a three bedroom. So then you can play with this tool. You can say, well, my budget's around say 450 in New South Wales. Here are some suburbs. I could look at Lismore maybe and give you an idea to start sort of shortlisting. And again, go through the same process. So you can check out, well, what's recently sold in Lismore, in New South Wales, am I okay being there? So again, you can go to this recently sold section, you know, for houses on bigger blocks of land, maybe it's not gonna be around my budget, but there you go. One sold in November last year, 535. Gives you an idea of what you can afford with your budget. Also, if you're flip-flopping between houses and units, the banks have different assessment policies. Check out huntergalloway.com.au slash tools. We have a bunch of tools and resources, including a buyer's brief and a step-by-step -step checklist to help with your search and follow through this process to narrow down places that are within your budget. And Nathan, following on from that question, you know, you might have missed out on a bunch of properties. It feels like it's hot. Is it worth getting a buyer's agent to find, you know, off-market deals? Can they help you get into your home? You know, do they cost any money? Like, what do you think about that? I guess with buyers agents, they're definitely a great resource to utilize. Obviously have a chat to a few, get an idea on their process and procedures. But if you are gonna engage one, really look at their process around getting off market deals. Are they gonna door knock? Are they gonna letterbox drop? Are they gonna get you in front of properties where there's no real competition? If they're gonna go online and find realestate.com.au properties that are going for sale, then it's probably something if you do your own research, have your realestate.com alerts on. It might not be so much value there unless you're really busy and you can't get out to doing those searches and open homes. But if they are getting you in front of properties that aren't yet listed, they're tying up with some real estate agents that might give them first opportunity, that's where they really have value in being able to help you get in front of those properties before there's real competition. Yeah, a lot of buyers agents I've seen actually even advertise on their pages how many off-market listings they get. And in a lot of cases, it's less than 20%. So a lot of the time, buyers agents are actually just getting properties on the market for their buyers. They might just be a bit more skilled around what the property is selling for, because otherwise, you know, like you saw from the market, there can be a big range of prices and it's always hard to kind of know what to offer. But some of those research tools that we set will help with determining that. And it's also worth factoring in a buyer's agent can cost anywhere from sort of fifteen dollars to $20,000, depending on what you're paying. And a lot of first home buyers would prefer to put that towards their deposit because you pay less LMI or give them a bit more options as far as budget. So the next question we have, Jaden, is how does your HEX or student loan debt affect your ability to borrow? Yeah, so it can make a pretty big impact. I know you've got an example for us in a tick, but at a high level, the banks calculate HEX not on what you owe. So if you're a lawyer or a doctor and owe $100,000, $150,000 in an engineer in your HEX, it's going to make the same amount of difference to your borrowing capacity as if you owe $2,000. Now, the reason for this is the banks calculate your repayments on your HEX based on the government repayment rate. So if, for instance, you're earning 130000 or even 68000 the banks will calculate your repayment per year for your borrowing capacity purposes based on the repayment rate or 4%. So you could owe 150000 you could owe 2000 and they're still going to take 4% out of your pay. So Nathan, give us the examples of how this actually impacts your pay and, and really the, the thing that it impacts is your borrowing capacity. They're going to lend you less if you have HEX and it just needs to be factored definitely. in. Yeah, definitely. Now, now I've got an example here that I'm looking at. Um, let's say that you're earning $100,000 a year. Um, you're wanting to purchase a property. Now, in terms of HEX and its impact on your borrowing ability, we're looking at about a hundred grand reduction in your borrowing amount. So if you only owe $5,000 on your HEX or a small amount, paying off your HEX can actually have a positive impact on increasing your ability to borrow. As you saw there earlier, guys, it does affect your borrowing ability less as your income's lower because it's based on a lower percentage as an ongoing commitment. However, it does make a difference nonetheless. So something to keep in mind, if you are looking to increase your borrowing ability, look at your HEX and if there's not much left, closing it out can have a good impact on increasing that ability to borrow. And also the question we sometimes get asked is when should I close this out? Should I close it out now before I get my pre-approval? I always say, wait, it's the same case with credit cards. You don't need to rush out and go close things off. Wait till you speak to your mortgage broker with a lot of banks. You can actually make it a condition of your approval or your pre-approval. So say for instance, if in Nathan's case, you need that extra hundred thousand dollars to pay out your hex, the banks can actually make that a formal approval condition. So I'll say, Nathan, before you settle on your home, you need to pay out your hex. 
and then we'll give you the money. So it's one thing, at least you're not having to pay off your hex and use your deposit up. It gives you more options that way to wait, chat to your broker and decide what's going to be best for you. So Jaden, are interest rates going up? Is this something I need to be concerned if I'm a first homeowner looking to get in the market and rates are going to skyrocket? Yes, yeah, so I'm sure before Christmas, you would have seen all the headlines where the banks increase their fixed rates again. They increased fixed rates almost five to six times in a really short period, and it really freaked out a lot of home buyers. Now, the fixed rates are what the banks think the rate's gonna be in the future. So for example, the two-year fixed rate is kind of what the banks are thinking the rate's gonna be in two years' time, three years, and four years, etc. Based on a lot of commentary, it is looking like rates are gonna go up sooner rather than later. But I think it's no cause to panic because realistically, we're still at historically low interest rates. From all reports we're reading, it's looking like rates are most likely going to increase mid to later this year. But if they do go up, it's looking likely it's going to be quite a slow increase. At the end of the day, the last thing the Reserve Bank wants to do is increase rates rapidly and then have a glut of properties going on the market and selling and potentially causing the market to crash. So if you want to calculate repayments, at the moment, they're still on the twos. But you know, for example, if you want to be sort of safe, um, maybe use you know three percent, maybe use three and a half percent, and still on a five hundred thousand dollar property at three and a half percent, you're only paying five hundred twenty dollars a week rent. So it's obviously higher than it was last year when you're getting fixed rates around one point nine nine percent, which is insane. But you know if you still be able to get rates around three percent, it's at all time market lows. It's it's still crazy cheap money, um, and still when you kind of compare it to what you're paying in rent. In a lot of cases, we're seeing it ends up cheaper still for your repayments. And just finishing off this point, if you are concerned about interest rates rising and you want some stability, that's why the banks have fixed rates. There's two types of rates. We're gonna hold on the video on that, but variable rates move up and down with the market, whereas fixed rates will be set for a point of time. Like I said earlier, three, four, five years. So if you're concerned about rates going up and you want that stability, it's definitely worth looking at the fixed rates because at least you know, it takes two, three years while you get settled at the home, you're gonna be fine. And the other thing to keep in mind is with the mortgage, at least you're going to own the place after potentially 30 years, you know, quicker if you're going to do it compared to rent where you're not going to own that place. You're just paying your rent, it goes out every week. So it's worth, you know, working out what's going to work best for your situation. So Jaden, I've heard about the first home loan deposit scheme. I've heard about the first home super saver scheme, the first homeowner's grant. There's so many schemes available, but I actually don't know what I'm eligible for. Can you walk me through that? Yeah, there are quite a number of schemes available most of them at the moment are geared towards new properties. New properties are ones that no one's ever lived in before. So after you have brand newly constructed, it doesn't really count if you renovate it for a property. So with the government grants, you know, the ten, fifteen thousand dollars that are getting thrown out, keep that in mind. Like Nathan said, there's the first home loan deposit scheme, which allows you to buy an existing property with a five percent deposit. Unfortunately, there's no allocations left. So that gets reset the first of July this year. So keep your eye out for that because it can really help with getting into the property sooner and save on lenders mortgage insurance. The other big one is the stamp duty concession. So it's worth having a play with our calculator. Um, this one works all around the country. This calculator is great to see what you're going to save. The, the stamp duty concession is probably the biggest thing that first home buyers going to be eligible for in 2022. So say, for example, you're buying a home in New South Wales to live in. Normally you'd pay 18,000 stamp duty. As a first home buyer, you're saving 18 grand. It's pretty massive. It can make a difference because otherwise, the $18,000 is coming out of your pocket. Um, so check out the calculators. Different states have different tiers for their concessions. Queensland, it's 500,000. New South Wales, Victoria, it's all different. But check out the calculator. That'll give you a good sense of what kind of incentives and what concessions you're eligible for in 2022. Now, also remember, if you're looking for a detailed explanation around all the grants available, we have done videos in the past. So check them out on our channel and you'll be able to get a better understanding of all the details. So Jaden, there's a lot of jargon that gets thrown around, but as a first homeowner, what is genuine savings and why is that important? So if you have less than a 10% deposit, the banks will want to see evidence of genuine savings. They just want to make sure that you've been saving progressively over time and you're going to be a good risk for them. The caveat there, like I said, is you have to have less than a 10% deposit. If you've got more, they're probably less worried about it. And if you get gifted your whole deposit, they're not looking for you know three months bank history of you saving your deposit. Now, a question I had this week on genuine savings was this couple was worried they'd move their money from ING to CBA to ANZ to Westpac. And is the bank going to consider it genuine if it hasn't just been sitting in one account for three months straight? And the answer is it's okay. As long as you can show, you know, from November to December, it was with ING, then January to Feb, it was with this bank, then Feb to March, it was with that bank. They're fine with you moving your genuine savings around like that as long as the account's in your name. So another example I had was where 
Um, a brother had given his sister his savings to invest the money. So I gave Nathan $80,000 to go invest and put in his offset account. Then Nathan, when it was time for me to buy my home, transferred the money back. The bank actually considers that gifted funds because it's not coming from my account, it's coming from Nathan's and they wanted to understand what's happened there. So keep that in mind, chat to your broker if your situations like that are a bit unique and work out the best solution there. Now, remembering guys, genuine savings is 5% of the purchase price held in your bank account for three months or longer. So on a 500,000 purchase, that's 25 grand. If you don't quite have the 25 grand saved in your account for three months or longer, if you have less than a 10% deposit, then the banks can also consider rental history. So once again, it's important to talk to your mortgage broker. There are ways around genuine savings and it's definitely worth having a chat to make sure that you do qualify for a loan that the genuine savings isn't gonna derail your plans. So Jen, we've talked about the minimum deposits required. Do you wanna walk us through the hidden costs associated with having a minimal deposit? Yes, I think the biggest costs involved in a house are one, the stamp duty, which you covered off on before. That's one that really creeps up and, and catches people out because it's just a huge cost that goes to the state government and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so always keep that in mind. There's also the bank deposit. So as we covered before, around 8% is the minimum deposit. And the reason being is the banks will lend up to 95%, including the lender's mortgage insurance, which generally works out to be sort of 92% loan plus 3% lender's mortgage insurance to get to the, the 95%. Um, so you just need to have that saved. There's no way of getting around that. And then some of the other costs are around $500 of borrowing costs. You've got solicitor fees or conveyancing fees about $1,500. You want to include some removalist costs of around say $2,000. Council and water rates, which might be around another $1,000 depending on when you're adjusting it for. If you're buying a unit or townhouse, you might be up for some strata or body corporate fees on settlement. So ask your solicitor on that. And usually it's, it's advertised on the listing so you know what the quarterly fees are going to be there. Home and contents insurance and registration fees. So in this example, on a home purchase of $555,000 in Queensland, the total cost is going to be around 16000 So you want to make sure you've mapped them out because there's nothing worse than getting the settlement. It's happened to me where you're short money because there was some unexpected costs there. And remember, the two major costs are if you can get your stamp duty waived, that's a major cost that you won't be paying, and the lender's mortgage insurance. Now, there are some lenders that do have specials at the moment for mortgage insurance waivers. Jaden talked about the first home loan deposit scheme, another way to get out of paying that mortgage insurance, which is a great incentive. So um, they're the two major costs plus those other costs there associated. So something to keep in mind when you are looking to purchase your first home. So Janet, a lot of first homeowners come to us with issues with their credit file. So walk through this. What if they don't have a credit history? What if they do have a small telco bill that they had issued with in the past? Um, what if I had a personal loan of three grand that went into default? So what does it all look like? Yeah, as part of your loan eligibility, a broker will be checking your credit file. But if you want to check it out yourself, just jump on getcreditscore.com.au. I definitely suggest looking for your credit file. You can go on Equifax um, and get uh, you can get one free credit report per year. Um, just to find out, make sure your credit file is all good. There's no defaults, like Nathan said. One that always catches people out is like old electricity bills. You might have been living with some housemates. The bill was in your name. Someone forgot to pay it, and there could be like a three, four hundred dollar default on your credit file and that can completely derail your loan application. Some banks may just straight up decline you if you've got an unpaid default on credit file. So it's worth checking out if you are concerned. And pretty much the way these and pretty much the way the credit files still work in Australia is it's just yes or no. So if you've got unpaid defaults, if there's judgments or there's issues on your credit file, it's gonna be straight up no. But if everything is good, pay on time or there's nothing to report on there the banks to say, tick, yep, Nathan, we're happy to lend you the money because you're a good risk. Now, a few things to keep in mind as first homeowners. One, if you've never had a credit history, when you go on Equifax, they're going to say that they can't find any history on you. There's absolutely no issues with that. We have a few first homeowners come to us saying, should I open a credit card? Should I do this? Should I do that? The answer is no. In Australia, it doesn't matter if you don't have a credit file, it doesn't go against you. Now, the other thing that we do sometimes see is if you've had a personal loan or a credit card going to default or arrears or in collections, that can have a huge impact on your application. So once again, get a copy of your credit file. If you're not sure, talk to your mortgage broker. He can guide you in the right direction. As well as that, there are credit reporting agencies that can help. And remember, there are credit repair agencies out there that can help with repairing your credit file if you do have a black mark against your name for something that you feel is incorrectly placed. Yeah, we had a client this week who had a like one of those old G credit cards that when we did the credit report, 
there was a bunch of missed repayments on there. And she's like, what is going on there? I don't understand what this was. And when she contacted them, the company said, bad luck, you missed repayments. There was no evidence of that. Uh, she had to end up getting the credit repair agency involved. Apparently it was basically a clerical error that the bank, um, or the credit card company had made. It took a couple of weeks to sort out, but it ended up getting removed and now her credit file's perfect. So yeah, it's not the end of the world. There's ways around it. You know, Sometimes banks make genuine mistakes and put things on your credit file that shouldn't be there. Even in the case of identity fraud, there's ways to, to sort of argue it and explain that it wasn't actually used. So the crux of it is get your free credit report, make sure it's all good because you just want to make sure there's no issues or no impediments when it comes time to buy your home. Okay, Jaden, the last question for today is how can I use my superannuation as a deposit to buy my first home? This was a big one in 2020 where the government was allowing people to withdraw super as a part of COVID relief. At the moment, the only way you can use your super is using the first home super savings scheme, which involves you making contributions to your super fund from your pre-tax money. Other than that, unfortunately, you can't just withdraw cash from your super to use towards your deposit. It's not allowed. Um, and even self-managed super fund lending just pretty much doesn't exist anymore in Australia on residential properties. So yeah, the crux is if you're looking at buying realistically six months plus, the first home super saver is an awesome scheme. Um, we've got a whole video on that. So check it out because it can help you make your deposit up way quicker. So that's it for today, guys. What did you think? Leave a comment below. Did you know that if you had issues with your credit file, you could still get a loan? Also, did you know that Hex reduces your borrowing power? Let us know in the comments below. As always, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, hit us up at huntergalloway.com.au and we'll see you next time.